that's really nice. The only time I've ever seen that kind of reception is usually for my wife. So it's a, it's a real ego booster. I want to say thanks to all the chairmen, Guy, uh, where are you? Thank you for pulling all this together. With all this. To that very fast driving boyfriend of yours, uh, your significant other, wow. So don't get in the green BMW, that thing. There's these circles, and we just kept going around and passing the passing really cool. uh, You all know um, how important New Hampshire is in American politics. You all know. You know everybody who runs for president, probably by first name, they probably go by your house and your church and your schools and everything else. Um, I know it's a great honor to be asked to be here, so I just want to say thank you. This is the epicenter of everything that happens in politics in this country. And uh, I want to return the favor and invite you all to come see that. Pat. We have all different kinds of people who come to see Pat. In full disclosure, obviously I'm a conservative. Sometimes people think I'm running a union. That's not right. It's a conservative union, not the other kind. A funny story, when uh, Obama was president, he was having a big global climate change conference and uh, asked people to testify. And no Republicans or conservatives were able to testify except me, because I thought I ran a union. So, you know, sometimes the liberals really aren't that smart. We sometimes get a little too scared. So, please come to CPAC. It's the last two days of February, first two days of March. As I said, I'm a conservative, mostly it's a conservative crowd, but there's moderates, independents, we like some liberals. We always seem to step in a little bit with some of our invitations. I'm sorry about that. That's just the way the world is these days, it seems like. Um, but I come with a kind of a more serious message tonight. Sorry, I don't mean to be a downer. Even after all the Greek dancing over here with the place. Uh, I think we're in a tough time as a country. Uh, you know, uh, we're reading a lot about scandals. Um, I, I'm old enough, turned 50 this year. I consider myself officially old. Think about the scandals of J. Edgar Hoover, of Senator McCarthy, Watergate, Really serious scandals. We're reading now about the scandals uh, that are happening, that happened throughout the 2016 election. We're reading about almost everything except the true scandal. We know what that scandal is. Quote unquote, we're going to stop him, said the head of counterintelligence from the FBI. And not only did they say they were going to stop him, they then used our intelligence process. They included the vice and court system, good judges, good people, honorable people, deceived and lied to about a dossier so that they could stop him. But that wasn't the only thing that happened in the Obama administration, as we all kind of sat back for eight years in kind of a stupor, as we couldn't believe what was happening with our government. The Obama administration spied on reporters Spied on reporters from the Associated Press. Spied on reporters from Fox News. That's not so surprising. They talk about a Trump enemies list. The Obama administration used the IRS to go after their political opponents. Maybe some in this room. In every of the 50 states. Tea Party leaders, conservative leaders, basically anyone who disagreed with them. Years and years of being tortured and persecuted by the IRS with all the incumbent legal fees. By the way, nobody went to jail because no one ever did anything wrong. Uh, and then finally, this ridiculousness with FISA. Now, you can all and say the deep state, and sometimes we sound like we're a little paranoid. I worked for President George W. Bush, that's where I met my lovely wife, Mercy. Uh, and those were the heady days after 9-11. Matter of fact, after 9-11, Mercy ran out of the White House in one direction, I ran out in another. And I remember talking to my sister on the phone, and it's kind of like I was i was in my 30s. I guess I thought I would be 30 forever. And all of a sudden, for a lot of us, we grew up that day. For me, I know I did. And uh, a student there after asked Mercy if she cared to hang out with me for the rest of my life. And she, thank God, said yes. Five girls later. Uh, five girls later, I consumed a lot of vodka. Um, it's going okay. But one of, the things, uh, one of the things that we talked about in all those rooms, uh, in the West Wing, and on 
Eisenhower office building, which many of you have been to, is we talked about the new powers that were given to the government to surveil our enemies. Remember, it was all about catching the enemies. And I remember being in a meeting with an eminent lawyer, who I won't mention his name, because those meetings shouldn't really be off the record. I wish more people in this administration would follow that, by the way. Some things are off the record. And I said, what will happen if we give the government this power to stop terrorists, which I'm all in on? What will happen if we appoint men and women in positions that misuse that power to start using that power to, look, to go after Americans and to surveil Americans? And I was told over and over again that our founders wrestled with the whole idea of government power in the Federalist Papers, and they came up with a system. And we have that system, and we have to trust that virtuous men and women will be put in these positions, and they will follow the spirit and the letter of the law. My friends, we had a, an administration for eight years that did the worst thing you could do. The worst thing isn't stealing our money, my God, it seemed to all be that. Congress would be indicted here and there for using their campaign funds, that seems to be a regular occurrence. Not good, but regular. But the idea of using the FISA courts, which were created to keep us safe, to quote unquote stop you, and to lie to these judges by giving them phony information. It makes me so upset. Why are we spending our money and our time to examine Donald Trump's big and extravagant life before he was president? Right. 10 years before he was president. Right. But you start going to the wrongdoing, but Loretta Lynch, Eric Holder, Jim Comey, that big tall criminal, McCain, Strzok, Page, Hillary Clinton. Remember what they said about Hillary Clinton? Well, it's, yes, she shouldn't have deleted her emails. Yes, she shouldn't have destroyed those servers, but what did Jim Comey say? It's a tough call to determine whether or not you should actually prosecute her as irresponsible as it was. Now, if you were to use that same language about Donald Trump's activities 10 years before he even thinks about running for president, let me tell you folks, if it's a close call, they want to put him in prison. If that's not obvious. It's like a coup before our eyes. And here's my question as a, as a Republican. By the way, as I said, I'm a conservative. I'm a conservative first. But here's the thing. I'll show you the best poll. Conservatives probably are the number one group in the country. The best poll shows from 40%. So guess what? All of us conservatives, we can't get it done alone. We have to pull in others. We have to pull in moderates. We have to pull in independents. We have to, Trump pulled in different kinds of voters. Trump even pulled in some of those old Reagan Democrats, those blue collar Democrats. I'm for expanding the coalition, but here's the fight. Here's the question for the Republican Party. This is the question of, of what's going on now. Can we fight? Yes. Yes. Are you sure? Yes. That makes me feel better. Because I think one of the things that Donald Trump shared or showed us is how serious the Democrats are about killing us, destroying us, knocking us down, killing us politically, by the way, let me be clear, but just doing everything they can to marginalize us. You know, I worked for President George W. Bush. Mrs. Patron remembers those, those days. You know, we came into office and we thought, well, we're just going to snuggle up next to those Democrats and they're going to realize that we're okay and we're in this together and we'll have compromises and it'll all be fine. Eight years later, he was a war criminal, a racist, a homophobe, an Islamophobe. 20% in the polls, Don Rumsfeld couldn't leave the country because he would get arrested. It ended there and it's never stopped being there. And I think it's sad, and it's unfortunate, and I hope our country can get to a better place, but we're not gonna to get to that better place by not acknowledging how serious all of this is. I think about all my times in working in Congress, working in the White House, working in politics. It seems like well, this is what Republicans tend to do. Don't worry, we don't wanna shut down the government. We only want 50% of what we want. We're gonna let you have 50% of what you want. And we start there. Any business person in this room knows that's a stupid place to start. If you start asking for 50, you're gonna end up with 20. And we'd end up with 18 and try to go spin it back at home by saying it's actually pretty good. So we didn't get zero, we got 18%. Trump says I want 100%, you're gonna pay for it. 
And by the way, we have a napkin payment, which I don't know if it's been announced or if it's soon to be announced, but it's right at the threshold. A napkin payment for the first time in a generation that's actually focused on everything that needs to be done for America. So we can have free trade. We can have free trade that's cognizant that America can no longer afford to just simply give things away. We can't do it. It's not going to work. So I think about all of this strategy on asking for it all. The, the, the craziness of asking for everything we believe in. Everything. By the way, you know Obama got everything he campaigned on? Have you ever thought about that? I thought about this, it keeps me up at night. I'm like, that guy got everything. Because when he couldn't get it from Congress, remember, we, we, after he became president, we won every election after that. Republican parties never won so much. We never had so many elected officials. And it was a lot of the, obviously, the, we were, the Obama agenda was repugnant. The only thing I can think of that Obama didn't do that he's going to do is he didn't close Gitmo. But he's so smart, he just let all the terrorists out. He closed them his own way. So get those days, but the people are gone and they're all doing terrible things. He got everything. And I look at that and I say, we can do that. We can get what we say we want. Think about what the Republican Party believes in when blowhards like me come in before you would talk. They say a lot of the same pattern. Do they believe it? Right? Do they believe it? Read our platform. How many Republicans want to implement that platform? I would tell you that not a lot. And that's one of our problems. I think whether you're pro-life, pro-choice, pro-gay marriage, pro-traditional marriage, whatever it is, as a party, we ought to look the American people in the eye and say, we stand for these things. And when we say it, damn it, we're going to do it. Anecdote, and I'm sure there's pro-life and pro-choice people here, but uh, you know this is mostly off the record. I see cameras, so, you know, we're gonna go with it, okay? But it's a, it's a free society. But uh, you know, when the, when, the, when the budget deal came out, uh, my wife relayed to me that the president said that they didn't get anything in the budget deal, the big omnibus deal. Did we get the, did we get the wall funding? Well, no, not so much on the wall funding. Well, did we get did we defund Planned Parenthood? Well, not really. So this is kind of what we face a lot, what you all have to face when you see what's going on in Washington, D.C. And what did Donald Trump say? He says, why didn't they at least keep up the inheritance? What he can't understand is that we've had these principles for my entire lifetime, 50 years. We are still talking about most of them. We're going to shutter the IRS and put a chain on the front door. No, we are not. We have to decide. If that's what we want to do, we could do it. But if we don't intend to do it, we ought to just quit saying it. And so, what has Trump been able to do with Republicans in Congress? We all know uh, the lowest corporate tax rates, which have made a huge impact, including on small, small business people, with the pass-through accounts. The president himself, from it, with his executive powers, is going to defund Planned Parenthood, which to me is amazing. We see what's going on with the media. Well, it seem like it's a bad thing. We've never been to that place, right? The president and the North Korean leader have met. The North Korean leader and the South Korean leader, me, uh, uh, leaders have met. And they say, well, the nuclear weapons are still there. We haven't made any progress. Let me tell you one thing I know. That little guy who runs North Korea is scared of Donald Trump. <laughs> I might do crazy things, and I think that's good for us. Like, Amen. That's right. I hope our enemies worry that Donald Trump might do something in the middle of the night that could be really bad for them. The new NAFTA I talked about, which I feel very hopeful we'll be able to get them. How about NATO? You know, the head of NATO called the president and said, Nobody has ever raised more money for NATO in the history of NATO than you. <laughs> President Trump because he actually said if we're going to say we're going to do 2%, hey guys, we're all going to do the 2%. And people are so used to in politics saying these words that mean nothing. And he said, no, it's going to mean something. The other thing is you read about these trade controversies, I'm a free trader, and full disclosure, I don't want to trade anymore. But Europe wants to deal with this. Because guess what? Europe knows that if we make a car, the very same car we could make in America, if we make it in 
Instead of New Hampshire, you make it in Canada, they avoided 10% levy when it goes to Europe. They know that stuff. Right? So why do we agree to these, uh, to these deals in NAFTA? These are the types of things that can change, and Europe is, knows that they've been getting away with this concept of free trade, which I'm totally for, but I'm not for bastardizing the term for agreements that are not free trade. The American people have wisened up to this idea. Just because you call it something doesn't make it so. And as a party and as a movement, let's re-examine our words. Let's quit using all these words we've always used. If they're hollow, they don't mean things to people. And we're a part of the idea that we're spinning something that's not truthful. We ought to stand for truth. Something like eight percent of the appeals courts will be Trump appointees. They have their eyes on the prize on how important the federal judiciary is now. For, for, for those of us who just might disagree on social issues but agree more on economic issues, do you know what judges get involved with today? It's not culture questions. It's every economic question under the sun. It was the Supreme Court in a five to four decision that said the carbon dioxide that's coming out of my mouth right now is as bad a pollutant as mercury flowing in the water. They decided that. It's a judge that comes in and tells the president, you cannot secure the border. It's a judge that tells the president, you must separate families because we don't want kids to be involved in the judicial process when an illegal family comes over here to America. And another judge in another jurisdiction who comes in and says, you can't separate those families. The federal judiciary is out of control. Yeah. And I would posit to you when the left tries to tell you that the selection of uh, Brett Kavanaugh is all about Roe v. Wade as pro-life as I am, that is not what it's about. It's about telling independent agencies and government they cannot do anything unless they can find the words in the Constitution. And they can't persecute small businesses and take their business. So I go back to this idea that has me a little fired up. And I'm going to actually be on the Shannon Breen's. Uh, I got to talk to Juan Williams tonight. You're, you're, I might need to have a good nice hand. Oh my lord. He's going to try to explain to me his point of view is that what Donald Trump did 10 years ago with a payment about a bad story in the National Choir. I've never had a story written about me in the National Choir. I have to say, if I learned that that was going to happen, I would be scared. You never know what they're going to say. Um, he's going to argue that all of this money from the special counsel and all this time, in fact, that every moment of Donald Trump's presidency, every moment of a Republican majority in the House and Senate since 2016, has been spent on the top, has been consumed with the topic of Russian collusion. <laughs> Russian collusion! I didn't say Russian canoodling. <laughs> collusion! By the way, collusion is a, it's a word that means nothing. There's no legal term about what that meant. I kind of thought a lot of us were letting that ride because we're like, okay, what you're pretty much saying is Donald Trump's a traitor. That's what that means. What they're saying is, is that he cares more about Putin than he does our Constitution and all your votes. That's what they're saying. So after the end of all this, it's about what he did 10 years before he was president. And, uh, and once again, I think about this, and we think of all the time we spent talking about Hillary Clinton. And we know it's a Clinton crime family, Clinton Incorporated. I mean, we're hoping that they, you know, go away, but I, I, I think she might be back. No. Oh, no. I really do. I, do. I think, you know, you know who Lady Davis is, right? Yeah. Lady Davis is, is the Clinton lawyer. And he came back around um, to make sure that Michael Cohen had uh, his services. Michael Cohen can't pay him. I think we should watch some money about who ends up paying Lanny Davis. He did start a GoFundMe page, which he is tweeting out himself. I heard that. Tweeting out himself and putting on Facebook because I think he wants his bills paid. Um, the other thing that I think is interesting is that, uh, you know, if I ever go on CNN, which I do from time to time, which none of you would know because I don't know if you watch it, but it's an interesting thing. You watch it, okay. It's, uh, it's frightening. But the. Um, but I always love this thing where they try to say, well, Trump's a liar. So let me just try to explain this real quickly how this works. There's about half a dozen or eight of these left-wing blog sites that track what every Republican says. 
And the purpose is for the left to own the truth. They're the truth ones. We know this, right? We're the liars, they're the truth ones. So the other day, I was on television when the, the, this tragic situation of family separation, which by the way, I don't make light of, I think it's a tragic thing. I, I think it's been hard for all of us to watch. I mean, the law is the law, but by the same token, um, it's been hard to watch the situation. And when the president realized what was happening, he stepped in immediately to try and fix it. That being said, it's not the Trump policy. It's Obama's policy. Obama separated families. It's a fact. It was written about throughout the last year of the Obama administration. I went on TV, and I said that on CNN. I said, don't call it the Trump policy. It's judicial policy, right, that Trump inherited. He's going to try to make the sense of it that he can. Uh, but President Bush separated children at the border. President Obama separated children at the border. Signed, to be honest. And the guy called me from one of these, one of these uh, Truth Squad places, which you see, you know, the Pinocchios, the Washington Post, the New York Times, they say, okay, how much is the conservative line? I was like, well, you know that Obama separated families. You know? And he's like, yes, it's true, but we think Trump is doing it more, so we're gonna say you're lying. So when they say Trump lies nine times a day, it is these left-wing truth squads that are saying he lies, then they multiply the number of days he's in office, and that's how we get these, Trump has lied 60,000 times, 600,000 times, I think it's all so made up. It's so absurd. By the way, the same time CNN is saying that, CNN is misreporting constantly. Now, I know a lot of these reporters, and I'll tell you one thing. Sometimes I actually don't think they're lying. Sometimes I just think they're stupid. But, you know, there's a difference. said that Donald Trump, that Lady Davis said that Michael Cohen was going to say that Donald Trump knew about the Russian meeting in Trump Tower. Well, it's a lie. He's now come out and said, well, no, not so much. Uh, they did something uh, the other day where they said John Bolton met with um, uh, a Russian spy. That was on their air. Can you imagine how John Bolton reacted to that? I don't know if any of you know John Bolton. John Bolton is on my board. Don't mess with the master of John Bolton. The point is, is this, even if you think that CNN is meaning to lie, and some of you may, I think sometimes they do that, but I think a lot of times they just get it wrong. President Trump's no perfect man. He has things wrong, he says things wrong. It's part, part, pretty perfectly, it's part of his charm, because he doesn't really understand government, because he didn't live his whole life in government. It's one of the reasons why we like him, and why we picked him. But just because... Just because you say things inartfully and not always completely accurately doesn't mean it's a lie. A lie is a moral judgment and a moral condemnation. And I'll be damned if I'm going to let anybody in the fake news give us moral condemnation. <laughs> we have to take the truth back. <laughs> and so we think about all these things we've lost. I'll get a little more uh, depressing here just for a minute. I got, as I told you, I got five kids. My oldest is 15. She's in the high school. They're, they're radicalizing the high schools. It's not just the colleges. It's moved to the high schools. She came home crying because she was the only one in her class that thought Black Lives Matter was a little radical. Or she didn't believe that we needed to have a carbon tax or that we needed to get rid of the Second Amendment. Um, so we've lost many of our colleges, almost all of our colleges and universities. Not all of them, but many of them. They've become radicalized. We've lost so much of the media. Look at the editorial pages. Look at what happens on television. We've lost so much of that. We've lost too many of our churches and charities. The boardrooms, and I work with some uh, Fortune 500 companies. They're scared to death to do what's in the interest of their shareholders and their, and their, and their customers. Because the left is constantly calling them to do something for this crazy idea or that crazy idea. And we've all watched it, they do it. They give in, they buckle to that kind of pressure, even when it's not good for their company and not good for their customers. The Boy Scouts. Yeah. I mean, the Scouts. Yeah. I mean, what are they? What do I call them? Is it Scouts? No. It's not Boy Scouts. They took it out. And my daughters were in Girl Scouts. Let me tell you, the Girl Scouts are worse. The Girl Scouts, my, my daughters had to go join uh, the Heritage Girls. Is it the Heritage Girls? Help me out. Um, because, you know, the Girl Scouts were funding Planned Parenthood and doing other things. I mean, we have let too many of our institutions go, so I have like, this crazy idea. Hands off the FBI. No. You don't get it. We get to keep it. You don't get to radicalize the FBI. Let's not let that happen. You don't get to attack 
the thin blue line at your whim and say that they're bad people killing people. They're saying they're protecting us. No, we're not gonna allow that to happen. The military, the police, and finally, ICE. You can't radicalize ICE. so many of the speakers you said tonight is I, I just believe we're in a mode where we have constitutional restoration. We really do. But President Trump might have been the last person that, that, that you would have thought would have focused so much on these constitutional principles, but it is what's happening. And let me tell you something. As I told you, I turned 50. I feel like I'm old, but I've learned something in those 50 years. It's the moments where there's the most chaos and confusion and turmoil and dust in the air. Those are the moments when you have opportunity. I believe that there's a dark side, I believe that there's bad people, and I think there's bad things that happen. And a lot of times all that's happening to try to confuse us and get us to turn against each other and to not unite. And we've got to unite like never before. Like I told you, I'm a conservative at best with 40%. We can't do it alone. We need to work with moderates and independents and even Democrats who realize their party are now filled with Marxists. They're not the Democratic Party of my grandparents or yours. We've got to work together. And, despite everything you're reading in the papers and everything you're seeing on television, we have got a fabulous opportunity. We've got an election, what is it, nine weeks away or so? It's really close. And they're telling you, what are they telling you? Big blue wave. Can't do anything to happen. Red tsunami! That's right, the, the, the red tsunami, I like yeah. that better. They're try you know why they're saying that, just so you know? It's to dispirit you. It's to, just, it's to break us. They're trying to break you. They're trying to make you think that what's going on with the special counsel has something to do with how he was hired. The man was hired to stop treason, right? Not police the playground and give out parking tickets and speeding tickets. And by the way, if the IRS wasn't going after the Tea Party, maybe they could have checked in on Paul Manafort. I mean, that's just a little bit of an idea. So I guess that's my final comment is, let's not let them discourage us. Let's realize that at this political moment, we have got to push back on this idea that they will literally have a coup on a president who's doing so much for the conservative agenda, the Republican agenda we care about. You know, if he does something that's impeachable, I'll stand up here and say it. There is nothing that he has come up with. By the way, when you don't pay your taxes, whoever here has been audited? Did you ever get done with an audit and owe, owe taxes? It's pretty common. You pay the damn taxes. This is not that hard. The IRS could have gone into Paul Manafort's office and gone through all his papers and said, you owe this many millions of dollars, and maybe he would have paid an astronomical fine. But you, that happens all the time. These are not impeachable offenses, my friends. And uh, and so we can't let them discourage us, and we have to and we have to fight together. This election is going to come down to three things. We all know what it is. They're going to impeach him the second they have a majority in the House. Nancy Pelosi, whether she says it's smart or stupid or wise or whatever, she will lead the charge to impeach Donald Trump. It'll happen as soon as they're sworn in. So just know that that's what this is about. And every congressional candidate ought to be saying that, because that's what this election is about. Right. Number two. <laughs> I think it's fun. You all in politics, you love that, right? Try to get it done. Try to figure out if we can work together. You can't work with a Marxist. No, no. There's no way. Day is going to be as radical as this Miss Cortez and Bernie Sanders and others. It makes it impossible to work with them. And so we have to understand that if you're working with a socialist opposition party, uh, that means we are going to have to go it alone on a lot of questions. Finally, this is a real question right now of can we work together? If we work together, we're going to win this election. We're going to pick up seats in the Senate. And we can still hold this election. We're going to give the president a real chance to continue this agenda, which is incredibly popular across the country. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Crop TV.